But to learn martial arts, it's not an intellectual subject matter, it's an experiential subject matter. And to really learn it, you have to do it. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 161, and thanks for being here. On today's episode, we hear from Mr. Randy Moy, a practitioner of Chinese martial arts from Massachusetts, with a beginning in Wing Chun and current training and teaching in Tai Chi. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts two times each week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host for the show, as well as the founder here at Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you checking us out. I hope you enjoy your time. We've started making some of our podcast episodes available as eBooks. Do you know a martial artist that doesn't have an interest in listening to these shows, but might enjoy reading some of the best ones? Be sure to recommend our books. Our first interview release is with none other than Bill Superfoot Wallace. Find our eBooks on Amazon in the Kindle store. You can find our show notes at whistlecakemartialartsradio.com, and that's also the easiest place to sign up for our newsletter. As a thank you for joining, we'll send you our top 10 tips from martial artists, an exclusive podcast. Our newsletter keeps you up to date on what's going on here at HQ, upcoming show guests, and even discounts on some of our great products. Today's guest is a thoughtful martial artist. There's really no better way to introduce him. Mr. Randy Moy struck me from the outset as a very contemplative person and someone with a lot to share. Today's episode brings us inside his life and his transition from Wing Chun to Tai Chi. While today's episode isn't full of high-impact stories, because that's not who he is, what it is, is easily one of the most quotable shows we've ever had. Check it out. Mr. Moy, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. And thank you for for making some time on this this cold day. We're not, based on your, your area code, you're not too far away so i'm guessing no. it's cold where you are as well, well. It's very <laughs> it's very cold here i'm just and, happy it's uh, above zero again happy to keep warm with my training <laughs> right yeah i mean hey maybe that's why you know we're so fascinated with with training outside because it's like a cheap form of of heat you don't have to load the wood stove or <laughs> crank the thermostat you can just you know work out it's almost like free heat well yeah. This is a martial arts podcast. We have you on to talk about martial arts and your stories. But before we really dig into to that, we've got to understand who you are. So how did you get started in the martial arts? Well, I uh, started in a, a southern Chinese boxing art called Wing Chun. It was uh, made famous by the actor Bruce Lee. So I started into that, um, practiced that for about... Uh, I would say five years, um, ever since I was in middle school, actually. And um, probably um, in a similar fashion uh, as, as of a lot of practitioners, I was prone to bullying. I was one of the few Chinese people uh, in a primarily Caucasian neighbor- neighborhood growing up. So I got picked on. Um, for being different. And so my father didn't want to be, me to be bullied. So I, I basically took up this, this martial art, um, to kind of gain a little bit more confidence, to be control of certain situations. Um, and then, um, you know, I've always heard of Tai Chi Chuan. I've heard the legends about Tai Chi masters, but it was never when I saw it, uh, my cup of tea until, um, I met my, my teacher now, Master Fong Ha from Berkeley, California. And the way that he moved, the way that he um, emitted um, internal energy, um, it was just very different from what I, was, um, what I saw in the parts of Chinatown. Um, and, and I got to experience his power. And uh, on top of that, he had a willingness uh, to teach, to actually teach the subject matter. And, uh, and so um, I became hooked onto whatever he's teaching for, I would say, over 18 years now. Wow. <laughs> so um, that's, that's kind of my background, and I'm still continuing to, to refine 
um, his art, and he would like for me to make it uh, my own art one day. Sure. Now, in there, you made a little bit of a comparison to the Tai Chi that you had experienced in Chinatown to what you had experienced in, in watching your master. Tell us a little bit yeah. more about that. What's, you know, kind of what's that difference there? Well, uh, you know, the, 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 the Tai Chi practice in the parks, I mean, it's, it's, I, I, I'm pretty sure that it's a free service. And so basically, I guess the American saying goes is that you get what you pay for. So, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, there's, there's not a lot of structure to the class. Some people are smoking, some people are having tea. They're not, I would say they're not being very, uh, mindful of what they're doing. A lot of the guys, they're just moving mindlessly and not mindfully. And so they would be just kind of doing what seems to appear like Tai Chi Chuan. And they would just talk in the middle and say like, you know, I'm giving you a translated equivalent, but like, Hey Jimmy, do you want to get some noodles later on? <laughs> <laughs> so it's not very mindful. It's a very, very mindless activity and it, it didn't look strong. It looked very weak, you know, and, and based upon, you know, my experiences now, there was no attention to, to body alignment or anything like that. So it never really appealed to me. And then, and, and then I would see demonstrations, uh, tai, so-called Tai Chi Chuan demonstrations. And they, didn't, and they seemed very, very impractical to me, um, you know, especially with, with my background in, in Wing Chun. And so I was like, you know, I said to myself, you cannot use this. You cannot use this in a real competitive situation. But now that I uh, have matured uh, in my practice in Tai Chi Chuan and I continue to refine the practice, I find, uh, you know, a better understanding of what these demonstrations are trying to do. And so I have a little respect, although I still say, I still make my previous comment that I would say that um, uh, the, the practical application of those demonstrations are, are, are very, it's, it's, there's little practicality to, to those demonstrations. And, what, and, and they're not properly explaining on what's actually happening. So it leaves, it leaves the audience with a sense of, wow, that's just, Take and I really don't know what's what's going on and and whatever it, it does it, I don't think it does a good job in promoting uh, the art as well. But mm. uh, some people continue to do that. <laughs> I think that so. that those you know in the park kind of quintessential practices, and I, I think most people have seen that at one point or another. If you've been through any city on a warm day, you've probably seen a few people doing tai chi in a park. And I think it leads to this perception that Tai Chi is simply a meditative practice and not rooted, excuse me, in any combat discipline. And it wasn't until uh, a gentleman that I was exposed to here in Vermont who truly understands Tai Chi at a, at a pretty deep level did I know that Tai Chi was more than a meditative practice or that it could be, I guess. Yeah. And I'm guessing that there are yeah. probably a lot of folks out there listening right now that are saying, wait a second, Tai Chi's not just moving around and breathing and doing short form, like you can actually use it for stuff. So I'm sure we'll have a lot more of that come out as we're talking, but I'm glad that, you know, you, you said that so early on, because I think it's going to shape the rest of our conversation. Sure, sure. We've all got stories. Every martial artist has stories, and, and martial artists have the best stories. What is your best martial <laughs> arts story? My best martial arts story? Well, um, I'm not sure if it's a story. Well, what do you mean by story, I guess? Uh, However you choose uh, to define it. My own personal experience, or... It, well, I would we'll say... leave it wide you know, open. I, <laughs> Well, I would say that um, uh, when I was when I was younger, uh, and I first, you know, learned that my Tai Chi master learned Tai Chi, knows Tai Chi Chuan. I would say, well, you know, with my background, I, I would say to him, "Well, you can't, you can't use Tai Chi. 
I, I've seen Tai Chi. You, you cannot use Tai Chi in combat. And, <laughs> and he said, well, well, try anything. Try anything. I said, you know what? I will just try, like, my hardest haymaker, and you won't even stop it. And then I was ended up fl- flown, like, six feet. Six feet back. And I said, okay, well... All right, so I was just doing a haymaker. That's not really what I do, but uh, you know, I also um, I also dabbled in some Muay Thai and all that, and and some Western boxing uh, before my Wing Chun, but mostly my Wing Chun, and I, I basically tried to use my my Wing Chun against my teacher, and um, I was unsuccessful every time. <clears throat> he basically knew all my moves. Um, and I don't, I'm pretty sure that he never knew Wing Chun. So, but he somehow learned to adapt to my movement and propel me back every time. <clears throat> so I guess that would be my story. That's what made me sold on, and this is what I want to learn. I don't care if you call it Tai Chi Chuan or, or Fong's boxing or, <laughs> whatever. You could just call it ballet if you wanted to. I would take whatever he, he's doing. <laughs> so what was and uh what what was going on in your head that first punch you threw? You know, cuz I'm getting the sense that that there was some a lot of confidence in you as you were throwing that, maybe even some ego. And yeah, to have yeah, it just there was, there was completely a lot of flipped yeah. on you. Literally. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 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 The thing that, the first thing that went through my mind is even though I was propelled back, it, it, a couple of things actually went through my mind. One, he never hurt me. That was amazing. I think that is, that, that and, and I learned that was one of the key skills to, um, to his, the, the, the lineage of martial arts is, is basically you could you could win you could con- control a person without hurting them that is that is the skill and so um, there was that piece and uh, you know very confident I was almost confident that I connected my punch with them mm. and 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 yeah the the power of this old man this old man can, can produce. It was just uh, amazing. Amazing. Wow. Okay. So other than martial arts, what hobbies or or passions do you explore in your life? Well, uh, uh, before martial arts, I was uh, really big into ice hockey and tennis. Um, and so, um, you know, comparing Western traditional physical exercise with the exercises introduced in the meditative martial arts like Tai Chi Chuan. I would say um, the meditative exercise has a much deeper and better feeling when you do them. Can you elaborate on that? I've done weight training. <clears throat> um, the best thing that I can think of is, I guess, you know, I used to do long distance running um, for my tennis training to, to, um, to build up your stamina. Um, and so, um, you know, take your runner's high. I guess. Mm -hmm. And I, if you multiply it by a million, you, you only even probably scratch the surface of what the meditative practices can do. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to be very, very dedicated in practicing four hours a day. Uh, now that I'm a married man, I've cut down to, Run two hours a day. Still a long time. And I still feel great. I still feel great. Um, 
like even recently, I actually started uh, bicycling. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, I loved mountain biking. Um, just going on, you know, rough terrain and using my mountain bike and going all over the place. <clears throat> and so in, even my brief stint, um, yeah, I've been mountain biking. I probably clocked in over, uh, I want to say, <clears throat> 60 miles so far. I still, still feel uh, much better practicing uh, like uh, all the meditative parts, all the meditative exercises uh, versus my cycling. Okay. Right on. I'd like you to tell us about a time in your life that you had to lean on what you've learned as a martial artist to help you move forward. Some kind of, you know, personal challenge or difficult stage. Well, I think one thing uh, that I like about what I do is that it's a life practice. I, I think, I think actually as a general, as a general um, statement for martial arts, no, not, not limited to Tai Chi, but Martial arts is, is a life practice. That doesn't mean you practice for the rest of your life, but I think what makes things powerful with me is that it's really incorporated into my life. So all the challenges uh, in my life are being... I, I harmonize those challenges. That's, that's the things that we do in, in my class. We harmonize conflict or we harmonize the challenge and we take it in and then we turn it into, we turn it back into balance. Okay. So for instance, you know, I work, you know, I, I work as an IT professional. That's my day job. And, you know, I teach Tai Chi on the side. <clears throat> so I, I work in healthcare and I deal with difficult doctors and nurses all the time. Now, a typical person could probably meet a difficult customer, if you will, a difficult end user um, with, with force. Mm -hmm. I don't do that. I actually take the oncoming force, you know, them, a nurse or a doctor yelling and frustrated at me, their, their frustrated energy. And I harmonize with it. I take it in, and then I I produce something positive. And so that their 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 frowns turn upside down, basically. Is there a particular time you can remember doing that that might might help illustrate? Oh, sure, sure. There was one time I was working um, <clears throat> at a hospital in Boston, an anesthetist. They're known to, to be the, the most difficult uh, end users. They, you know, they, they said, um, they, were, they were telling me, you know, I, I hate technology. I hate computers. You know, I even have a secretary writing my emails. I can't stand this stuff. You can't, you know, you can't make me do this. I'm not going to do this. I'm an anesthetist. That's all that I do. And, you know, you know, I could say like, Oh, tough crap. You have to do this. <laughs> so instead I said, well, yeah, I understand it could be a challenge, but you know, I would just give little, little bugs in their ears. Like, did you know you could do this and, and, and actually show them mm -hmm. like how, easy something can be and I start to like add more and then I became the point person like no I like e e to the point where like they wouldn't go to another IT analyst they would go to me and he, he would say like I want Randy I want Randy Moy and I want him to tell me how to do this and so it got more and more and that anesthetist that hated technology so much he's an older gentleman I actually inspired him to get an iPad and he just loves, he's starting to love technology now. Mm. 
he's starting to just pick my brain on whatever, uh, you know, technology related questions he needs answered. Wow. And so he went from hating technology to loving it. So I basically turned something negative, harmonized with it and brought him back to balance, bringing him to a state of comfort. And here we sort of have the, what seems to be the philosophy for your martial arts training, that redirection of energy, conversion of, of something negative into something positive. Uh, you, you didn't speak to yeah. this part, I wouldn't but say I'm... it's redirection of energy. It's, okay. it's more like absorbing the negative, okay, and just bringing it back to harmony. Okay. And I'm going to guess that he probably didn't even know that you were doing it. No. Okay. Interesting. So it sounds like the way you perceive the world, you could do this for everything, for everyone, if it was necessary. Yeah. Is that, would you agree? Yeah. Yeah, I try. But again, the system is natural. There will be times, you know, the people, people mistake that, you know, Randy never gets mad. I get mad. I'm human. <laughs> right? Yeah. So this is, <laughs> this is, this is a natural thing. Be, <laughs> you know, I get, there are some, I, I guess people go to some schools, they claim that they're, that their teachers never mad. And I'm like, well, that's not being human. <laughs> mm. That's not natural. I don't see how that could be. You can put yourself in a state where you can minimize it, though. And that's what I try to do. So it might, it might be perceived as, well, that person is never mad. Right? Because you're trying to reduce the frequency and the extent. Of course, of sure. course. Okay. Who would you say... And I'm going to exclude your current master because that's kind of the obvious answer to this question. Who has sure. been the most influential person or, or secondarily, right? If, if your master is, is the answer, the most influential person on your martial arts upbringing. Well, that would be my senior. My, uh, so in Chinese, my Si Hing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> There are two, um, I, I unfortunately don't want to um, broadcast their names, but they're That's fine. two brothers. They're wealthy Wall Street businessmen. Um, and they were the ones that taught me Wing Chun. They were the ones that actually introduced me to another, actually my first meditative martial art, which is called mind boxing. And then from mind boxing, they said... I'd like for you to learn from my teacher as well. I think you're dedicated and uh, I think you're, um, you train, you train hard. You show your dedication. I think you need to go up to the, to the top of this, which is now my Tai Chi teacher. And he taught me Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. And so, um, my seniors <clears throat> from New York city, uh, were, uh, are, are probably, I mean, I, w I would put them all at the top, actually, but um, if I had to um, put somebody in second, and especially um, rank-wise, it would, it would be my seniors. Cool. Are you still in touch with them? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I train with them all the time. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm sorry. Not all the time. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, they come to Boston because uh, they have family in Boston every every now and then. But I used to go every weekend to New York City to train with them. Wow. that That is dedication. Yeah. For sure. If you could train with someone... Didn't show dedication at first, but... <laughs> oh. Uh, okay. Well, tell yeah. us about that. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, they're, they're very strict. And you know what's great? I mean, what, what was a very good opportunity for me, and it didn't. It took a little bit of time for me to, to realize this was, you know, that they didn't charge anything. So I basically went through uh, the traditional 
uh, I, I guess you would say the traditional Chinese way of training, which is basically, I mean, the, the, the underlying, uh, I guess, rule is, you know, if I'm not charging you anything, basically the cost is time, their time. If, and, and time to them is money. So if I'm wasting their time, I'm wasting their money and they don't like that. Mm -hmm. So I would, there were, there were times early, like in the beginning that I wouldn't practice what I was told. I would drive down expecting to learn some more. And they said, take your stuff, drive right back to Boston. Because you hadn't practiced and they knew it. Okay. Oh, they knew as soon as I walked in. How could they tell? When you practice certain things, you could, you, you start to develop your own skill and you could actually see, and, and, and they've actually been through what I've been through, you know, not practicing. And their teacher said the same thing. You're not practicing. So they know what it feels. They know how it feels. They know how they can observe how people move. They can observe everything, their energy. You just start to, you just start to realize certain things. Hmm. I mean, we've always, I, I was raised that that was kind of the old way. But I've never experienced it. And I don't know that I've ever spoken with someone who experienced that firsthand. So what was it like after the first time that happened? I mean, did that were were you were you considering stopping your training or or did it inspire you? No, I was persistent. And p- part of it was uh, you know, a, another luxury is that these um my seniors are our family friends. <clears throat> so my father was, was a, a, a strict person. Um, he said, uh, you know, you do what they say or don't even bother coming home. Hmm. Wow. How, if I may ask, how old are you at this time? That this, that that's going on. I'm 30. So I, st- I started my martial arts very young. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but during this time, where because to me, I'm almost hearing a bit of of rebellion. You know, to to make that drive, having not done something, expecting to learn more. I mean that when, when that was essentially homework, right? I mean that that sounds like a like a rebellious stage, something I would associate with a with a teenager or someone in their early twenties. Uh, even younger. Okay. Even, okay. Yeah. 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 You know, I started my drives down to New York city, uh, at about uh, at 16 and a half is when I could drive. Okay. And then, you know, I even started training with them even earlier than that. You know, they would come to Boston, uh, you know, once, once a month, uh, because they have family to visit and they, they made time out for me. And my father was like, you know, they made time for you. You need to do what they say. And so, um, yeah, okay. that was, that was the tradition. Okay. Now here on was the sh- a rebellion? I wouldn't say it's a rebellion. It was more like, well, getting into it. You know, 16 and a half was probably, 16 and a half, 17 years old was probably the time when I started my, my world, the world of meditative martial arts. Okay. Here on the show, we, we talk, um, a fair amount about competition and I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, but has that ever been part of your practice? Competition? No, I don't believe in competitions. Okay. Could you tell us why? 
Well, what is a competition? A competition is simply that if you win a competition, what does that mean? That means that you were the best person at that given point in time. The other person that you won could have had a bad day or could have been off. But, I mean, I think it... It, I think it takes away the essence of martial arts, of traditional martial arts. I mean, people like it, right? I mean, if they like competing, that's fine. But if if they like competing and they're they want to learn traditional martial arts, they I think they'll. I I am hoping they will find that they don't. They'll find that the comp actually doing competitions is lacking. Hmm. Interesting. When you were younger and you were practicing Wing Chun, did you have the same philosophy? Yes. Okay. Was that something that was instilled in you or something that you came to understand on your own? Well, competition to me, okay, I, I guess if you, if you were to look at competition, it was more for the sake of learning. So competi- people would say I would compete with, you know, I was a y- young punk. <laughs> uh, I would compete other schools of different styles, karate, judo, um, uh, other styles of Chinese martial arts, Shaolin, all, like all of those traditional Shaolin. Um, it's a, it, it wasn't for the sake of winning. It was all for the sake of learning, like, Am I, can I apply what I've learned? So people might see it as Randy competes everywhere. Hmm. But I don't say it that way. I don't look for a gold medal. Never. Or, or a trophy. I, I don't care. And with, with Tai Chi competitions, the, tai, the problem with competitions in the Tai Chi world is that it misrepresents the art. Totally. Because it's, it's not what I do. Or any of the big names of Tai Chi practitioners do. Okay. If you had the opportunity to train with anyone that you haven't, be they someone that's still living or someone that's passed on, who would you want to train with and why? Um, if I had the opportunity, uh, well, there was another uh, Tai Chi teacher that I learned for two years. She's a Taoist nun. Her teacher was actually featured in National Geographic. Um, uh, for being, I think she was 103 years old when she was um, when she was interviewed, and um, the last time I heard, she's still living. So that's she has to be 110 if she's still living right now. Um, <clears throat> so I would learn with her. She's produced some amazing healing abilities. Um, she's really uh, very good at, at healing and um, the meditative practices of Tai Chi Chuan. Um, I believe that she knows the original Tai Chi Chuan before it broke out to the different lineages. What do you mean there are different lineages? Is, is it you know, when when I think of karate, I think of the different styles of karate, but I don't. I never think of right. of you know, kind of one. You know, I mean, maybe it was there, and 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 we just don't know about it. But you know, I'm not aware of any one kind of unified style. Is that something that does exist 
Was no, it's not, I wouldn't say it's unified style. Okay. So, so if if history if the history is correct, you know, Tai Chi originated in in uh, in the Taoist temples of Wudong Mountain, mm-hmm. and then. Um, and then it started with the, I believe the Chen family, um, the, the Chen family started to learn, uh, and, and incorporate their, their, uh, experience in Shaolin boxing, incorporate their Shaolin boxing with the Taoist practice of Tai Chi. And then they created their own Chen style Tai Chi Chuan. And then from there, you start breaking off into the the famous Yang family, Tai Chi Chuan, the Wu, the Hao families. So the 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 five, I would say the five uh, major families of Tai Chi Chuan. I would think of them as family businesses. Mm. <clears throat> that makes sense. Yep. Okay. Do you enjoy martial arts movies? I do. I think. Um, I think. Martial arts movies are a double-edged sword. I think they, you know they're great for for promoting martial arts. You know, especially being an ex Wing Chun practitioner, I love seeing uh, movies uh, that promote you know um, Wing Chun, like Yip Man. I don't know if you've seen that uh, with, oh, with yeah. uh, Boston native Donnie Yen. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Um, so I, I like seeing like that, but I also I also think that uh, media misrepresents martial arts, <clears throat> and uh, and that it's all about violence and kicking ass. And um, studying traditional martial arts, it's you know the term martial arts means art of war means. There, there is a competitive aspect, but um, martial arts to me goes back to the state of survival in human beings. What do you need to do to survive? And it, 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 it's a representation of, of, of the world. We, we don't live in a safe world. So we need to do something to survive, and that is the practice—the practice of survival. Mm. So, despite the the double-edged sword of martial arts movies, do do you have any that you enjoy that you're 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 willing to mention? Sure, sure. I love. I, I mean, I love all the Bruce Lee movies. You know he's a, he's a great you know he's a he's a a person that um <clears throat> that's that's on on the big screen that that represents I would say um uh, a traditional martial artist <clears throat> um and, and I, I I I do like you know um the the, the first Yip Man movie yeah um. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. It's you know it's great that it you know promotes some of the the Wudong arts. Yeah, so uh, I, I do enjoy them. Um, now you mentioned Donnie Yen, and and you mentioned him you know with a little bit of hometown pride, and that's something that a lot of people don't realize is that he's he's from New England. In fact, just a little bit before we got on to talk. I was messaging with a past guest, someone who is, you know, spent a lot of time doing doing wushu and some white crane. Um, his episode has come out. It's uh, Mr. Michael Staples. And he mentioned, because we, we were just kind of chatting, that, you know, decades ago, he was exchange, exchanging books with Donnie Yen's mother in, in Boston. And just, you know, the ties, the very subtle kind of ties that he and, and especially his mother have had to Chinese arts in this country, the more I learn, the more blown away I am. Is that something that 
you were aware of? Were you aware of of, of Donnie Yen and and his mother and and their um, influence? I guess on Chinese martial arts as you were coming up. Well, I, I always knew of both and Mark, his mother. I mean, she's had a, um, a wushu school for the longest time now. I think she's retired from teaching. Um, so I always knew of of her. Um, and I knew her her son practiced, you know, she, she taught her son. And, uh, and he went on to pursue an acting career. Um, so I always knew that, yes. How about books? Are you at all uh, a reader of martial arts books? When I was young and foolish, I read martial arts books. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So let's let's dig in there for a second. Foolish. What what is foolish about martial arts books? Well, I think you know it's. Uh, I think what I'm seeing now with current students uh, and past students is that the martial arts, I think number one enemy is time. I think a a lot of people are filling up their calendars with too many activities. Mm. And so there's just, I think now there's just not enough time to kind of stick through books. I mean, they're, I guess they're a great way to promote martial arts. That's one, it's, it's a media, uh, format. Um, if you, I find a lot of people just want to like, like to learn about the history of martial arts. Um, and I guess that's fine if that's your thing, but to learn martial arts, you cannot, it's not an intellectual um, subject matter. It's an experiential subject matter. And to really learn it, you have to do it. And, and you have to, you have to go to a teacher and, and kind of have him share the, the methods and the, the experiences with you that they have done. Okay. Now, as we've talked today, it's, pretty clear how dedicated you are, how passionate you are and, and just the, the personal development aspect I'm guessing is what's most important to you. But if you had to lay out any goals, is there anything that you're working towards with your martial arts practice? Mm, I don't, I don't like to seek anything. I just kind of practice what I practice and, uh, you know, if, if, if something develops, um, that's great. If not, you know, I don't want to worry too much about it. Um, uh, you know, there were, you know, I was, I was told of the story of, of, of a, of a monk learning meditation and, um, you know, he went to the abbot and he said, you know, I saw, I saw something. I saw like lights and colors and, 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 and the abbot said, well, that's fine. Just keep practicing. Like he thought that he was reaching the end. There is no end in martial arts. That's a pretty poignant statement right there. There is no end in martial arts. No. And going back to competition, going back to competition, it, it actually, you know, you, you talk about competition, it actually, you know, the competition leaves this sense that this is it. Like, you've reached the end when they're, you know, that's, that's far from the case with, with martial arts. Okay. What if somebody wants to get a hold of you or, or maybe drop by to, to train, you know, become a student, how would they do that? Sure. Well, um, I teach at uh, Santosha Yoga Studio in Milton, Massachusetts. 
I teach Tuesdays and Thursdays from 7.20 p.m. to 8.45 p.m. Uh, they can reach me via email at randy at swimmingdragontaichi.com. Or they can call me at 617-297-8275. They can reach me that way. Okay. I teach anybody, uh, and it's wonderful. I have a good group of people. They're all very nice, uh, blessed with students that aren't crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Or, uh, you know, they're, they're all very friendly people, and uh, they all like what I do, I hope. <laughs> they're still coming back. So. They're coming back. You're doing <laughs> something, like right? Do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so a lot of them, they tell me they, they receive a lot of, a lot of um, health benefits, um, and, or just they just love it because it's fun. And uh, I continue to try to inspire people. Um, to practice it and to to show my love for Tai Chi Chuan so that they can love Tai Chi Chuan and make it a, make it a, a a lifelong practice. And if you had to leave the listeners with some parting words of wisdom, what would they be? All martial artists, um, I would say, should study the internal methods and practices of the meditative martial arts. Coming from, you know, comparing the both schools, I personally think that the meditative martial arts are the ultimate. Throughout our conversation, I could almost hear Mr. Moy thinking. I can imagine that if the two of us sat down together for any reason, it would probably turn into some great talks and most likely about any and every subject. Thank you, Mr. Moy, for your time today. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes with photos and contact info for Mr. Randy Moy. You can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. Our username, Whistlekick. You should also check out our Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. We're always open to new guests, so if you have somebody you want to recommend for the show, maybe it's your instructor, maybe yourself, get on over to the website, fill out the form, and we'll see if we can make that happen. If you like the show, please be sure you're subscribing. And if you're up to give us something back, help us out. The best thing you could do right now, check out that ebook that we put out. Recommend it to your friends. If you've listened to the show, if you know the content in there, leave a review. Lots of great ways. We really think that this ebook thing is going to work. We've got a lot of you listening to the show, but we know that there are a lot of others that don't listen to podcasts, but enjoy reading. So help us grow this part of our business and It'll mean more good things for the show, which ultimately comes back to giving you great new stuff to listen to and check out. I appreciate your time today. And until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.